Well, good morning, everybody. How's everyone doing today? Can you do better than that? Come on. So good to see everyone. Hi, my name is Eric Bucci, and I'm the lead pastor here at the Cornerstone Church. And if this is your first time joining with us today, I want to personally welcome you. And also, everyone that's watching online as well, can you guys do me a big, big favor? We do this every week. Let everyone know that's watching online. It's a whole lot better in here than it is at home. And nice and loud and obnoxious so they know you love them. Go ahead. Come on. There we go. I don't know about you, but I like good news. And you know what the gospel simply means is good news. Well, we are in a series on, on the Beatitudes, which simply are the, the preamble to the um, something called Sermon on the Mount, which is that Jesus is tr- tremendous teaching. It's almost like a completion of the Ten Commandments, and we're going to be going through that together. It is such a rich, rich passage of Scripture because it's the very word of Jesus. It's controversial. It will rock your world. It really will. It's incredible. And so I'm really excited about the series that is coming. This is the preamble to it. These are the things we are to be, things that we are, and then we talk about the Sermon on the Mount. So we're going to be doing all sorts of things. Next week's going to be a really great opportunity. But today we're talking about the Beatitudes and attitudes that elevate to God's altitude and having the right thought processes. Last week, we spoke about persecution. This week, we're going to define it a little bit more. We talked about international and all that type of thing, but there's all types of persecution that you and I will experience. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, we will experience persecution. How do we deal with it? How do we get ready for it? And this is not something you're going to sell a lot of books about. I I never saw a bestseller called persecuted and how to enjoy it. I never saw that before. Uh, you know, how to be rich and, and have a great family and how to flourish. I mean, that's what, that's, what, that's what sells in the Christian marketplace. But who wants to hear about persecution? My friends, it is something that is a part of the church, always has been, and it's coming to a theater near you. So what do we do about it? How do we handle it? It is good news, by the way. It is absolutely good news. So I want to go ahead and talk to a bit about with you today and how we are to handle when things go wrong. What would happen... If you're at your job and they basically said, you need to stop going to that church you go to because it is a registered hate group, because they speak against certain types of people that we deem as in that, that are being hurt. And so you're going to have to sign this document and you cannot go there. We saw that you were in your Facebook, but we as an organization cannot support hate speech. Not only that, but it is a health crisis because what they're doing is endangering the health of boys and girls and people, and it is a health crisis. And since it's a health crisis, you must comply or we'll fire you. Now, you think I'm making this stuff up. It's happening in Canada. All right, now, I, I'm talking about belief. I'm not talking about mask and all that kind of I'm talking about belief in Jesus Christ. So what are you and I to do about that? Are we, you know, are we to pick it? Are we to storm the White House? What are we supposed to do? Well, I have news for you. God's ways are higher than man's ways. And you and I need to step out of the world's ways, and we need to enter into the kingdom of heaven because there is power, there's grace, and there's excitement coming ahead for all of us. So today we're going to talk about how do we deal with it? What does the word of God say about it? This is what Jesus says. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Okay, for righteousness sake, not for foolishness sake, not for silliness sake, but for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Jesus says, rejoice and be glad. Now, it doesn't make any sense. Why would I be glad for persecution? It doesn't sound like fun losing your job. It doesn't sound like fun not being able to send your kids to college or to school because you've been regulated by the Chinese government as someone that it cannot participate because of your, what you believe. Why would you rejoice if you're in North Korea and you're imprisoned in a prison camp? Why would, you, why would you rejoice when you are persecuted in the most persecuted place on the planet Earth right now and move from North Korea to Afghanistan? 
Why would you rejoice if you lost your family? Why would you rejoice if you, if you suffer persecution? Well, great is your reward in heaven, for they also persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, this is a question I ask. Why would people persecute the church? Jesus just gave us the Beatitudes. These are all wonderful characteristics. He says, if we do these characteristics, we'll be persecuted. Why would you persecute someone who's poor in spirit? Why would you persecute someone who believes that they need God? Without God, they can't function. Why would you persecute someone who mourns, that, that is going through a difficult time, it lost a loved one or something like that? Why would you persecute someone who mourns and that believes the better days are coming? Why would you persecute someone who is meek, who doesn't think they have it all together and w- will think about you first? Why would you persecute someone who's meek? Why would you per- uh, persecute someone who hunger and thirst for righteousness? They want to do the right thing. They want to pay their bills. If you give them extra change, they'll give you the change back. If you drop your wallet, they'll pick it up and give it back to you. Why would you want to persecute someone like that? Why would you want to persecute someone who's merciful and and they're your boss and you you made a mistake and they could fire you, but instead they turn the other way and say, you know what, we all make mistakes. Why would you persecute someone like that? Why would you persecute someone who's pure in heart and you know their motives are really to get to know you? Why would you persecute someone that makes peace? It does not make sense why would the world persecute you because the world has been given to the enemy and persecution will come and is happening right now around the world it comes in many 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 forms there's all types of forms there's for example those physical and imprisonment those are the obvious ones this is happening across the world right now. There's, uh, for example, another one would be economic. Maybe you, you can lose your tax base, or maybe you can lose something. Maybe you lose your job. I don't know. Another way it can be is academic. Maybe you, you fail your course, or you don't, get, you don't graduate because your thesis goes against what the narratives of the university. The universities used to be the place for open thinking. The universities used to be a place for open debate. Now you have to toe the line in many places. It's almost like fascism. It's almost like communism, everybody. This is what's happening. And so we see it taking place. Or socially, you'll be ostracized. Oh, one of those people, huh? And who knows what's going to happen as a result of that. So the government could come to the church, and they could arrest us. Persecution does not feel good. Persecution is not fun when you lose family members. It's very, very painful. Make no mistake. It's not something that you and I want to have. Then why does Jesus say blessed and rejoice for these things? You know, it's so interesting. Every other beatitude was blessed once. But with persecution, Jesus does a double take. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. Why? Because we will be persecuted if you follow God. You know, what's so interesting. There are people that so-called follow God, but they don't. For example, the Westboro Baptist Church, which is ridiculous, which is a horrific, uh, I don't know why they call themselves a church. And and what they do, they picket soldiers that died in in Afghanistan or Iraq. They picket all sorts of people saying they're going to go to hell. God hates homosexuals. God hates adulterers. God hates uh, soldiers. God, and they hate everybody. And that's what they put down there. And they have these signs. They're going to burn in hell. You're going to burn in hell if you have a divorce. You're going to burn in hell if you do this. I mean, they're against everybody. It's horrible. And they use scripture in the name of Jesus. And they say, those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what they say in their website. And they're horrific. And what happens is the media looks at that and goes, aha, this is what Christians are like. And they try to associate Westboro Baptist Church with us. My friends, that's not being persecuted for righteous things. That's being flat out evil. Hatred is never a good thing. Worse, n- hatred is never a good thing. Let me say that again. Hatred is never a good thing when it's against people. How can you say, what about the Old Testament? And they wiped out a, and doing all these things. What about all these things? Well, we're in the New Testament, and the context of this is different. We're going to talk about this, by the way, in the coming weeks. So how do we handle it? All right? Well, let's think about this for a moment. If, if someone you know, imagine a loved one comes to you, I have cancer. You idiot. You have cancer. I hate you. No, you wouldn't do that, right? We mentioned that last week. If someone has cancer, what are you going to do? You're going to fight against the cancer, but you're going to love the person. 
If someone has diabetes and, and they refuse to stop eating sugar and they refuse to stop eating the wrong foods, what are you going to do? You're going to love them. You might raise your voice. You might make, a, uh, you might make a, 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 an, an intervention or someone's on drugs or heroin or something like that and it's hurting them. It's destroying their family. Realizing that 70% of all domestic abuse among children happens from people with substance abuses and what you're trying to do is stop the legalization of these things that hurt society and, and you're not doing it because you hate the people because you love society and so imagine if you will if you knew someone had brakes in their car that we're going to give out and they're going to go to mount washington hey listen brother uh, it's okay you know you can you can drive your car i don't want to be judgmental but you might want to be a little careful with the brakes you wouldn't do that you'd say listen i'm concerned for you I'm concerned that you're going to be going on this trip and your brakes might give out. I'm concerned if you don't go and see a doctor, you might die of this disease. And I care enough about you to tell you that. I care enough about you to say if you don't get off these, this heroin, it's going to destroy you and your family. I love you too much not to say something. So when Jesus tells us to love our neighbor, that's part of loving our neighbor. Okay, but that's not hatred. You can hate what the person is doing. You can hate the disease. You can hate opioid addiction. Right? But you don't hate the people. And what's been happening is we've been buying in to the lie. Jesus tells us to love him and bless our enemies. Hatred is never okay. Unfortunately, the word hatred has been used a lot. I mean, it's been over. I mean, it's like my, my kids saying, come up for dinner. You hate us. That's a hate crime. I'm not coming to dinner. <laughs> and to tell those school. They, I mean, that's what's going on right now. They're, they're taking these words, hatred, and just throwing around everything that they don't agree with. They don't like it. You're hate crime. You're, you're, you're whatever, right? They, they label us various things. Well, hatred, how a true hatred is never, never okay. But I say to you, this is what Jesus said, everybody. This is what I say to you. Love your what? Scream at your enemies. Love your enemies and what? Pray for those who what? Persecute you, all right? But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So there's all about the sufferings. We're supposed to pray for those that persecute us. We're supposed to rejoice in sufferings. So never is it okay to hate our people. We should be praying for people. Now, I'm going to say something that's going to offend some people, and I, I just, I'm at the point now, are we going to be a church that's afraid to speak the truth, or are we going to be a church that speaks the gospel? And so the gospel we must stand on. And so when I see a pastor that is fairly, pretty famous, he's sitting there talking about uh, current events, and he's a pastor, he does crusades, and behind him it says, go Brandon. And that's not right. That's hatred. That's wrong. It's a, it's a, it's a scourge upon us as Christians. When you have a convention of believers together, and they have, let's go, Brandon, chant going on. No, you're at, probably asking, what's that all about? Well, there was a race car driver who was being interviewed by a woman, and the crowd was saying, they were saying things about the president, blank, blank president, basically. And so she tried to cover the fact that they were saying that, and she said, oh, they're saying, let's go, Brandon. So people took that. So now if someone says, let's go, Brandon, it's basically saying, blank, the president. Now, what does the Bible say? We should pray for those in authority over us. We show, show respect for respect is due, right? Pray for those. And when, when the Apostle Paul wrote that, they were on the Roman uh, empress. So it's wrong. I'm going to flat out say, it's wrong. If you're doing that, stop it. Maybe you gave in to it. Maybe you're giving in to it. Do not do that. That's wrong. That's wrong. We should pray for our president. I got in a little altercation uh, on Facebook with someone that said something, and I said, no, well, I pray for my president. And she, we're going back and forth. I, I, never, I never do that, but I had enough. <laughs> and my wife she just says it's not worth it and she's right because I stirred a whole I stirred a whole pot of bees nest and people were saying things about me and da 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 and I was like you know what I'm not doing this anymore but I got frustrated because you know this person's a Christian this person I love is your dear sister and she's saying these things it's wrong we should pray for those in authority we can say what this person is doing is wrong it hurts people but I am not going to say blank the blank okay is that is that clear everybody so I'm, this is not an opinion this is the word of God. We're supposed to not curse our leaders, but pray for them. We should pray for our enemies, not curse them. And what we're doing is we're following the same game plan as those that are not believers that are coming against us. 
You see, there are lies against Christians. Before you can persecute somebody, I mean, how are you supposed to persecute someone that's gentle in spirit? You've got to make up lies. And so what they did with Jesus, they made up lies. He's trying to overthrow the Roman government. He's saying we should not listen to the rules of the land. They made up all sorts of stories about Jesus. They made up stories about Stephen. They'd hire a mob. They hired these people to tell false accounts. And they, they, they did it all through the scriptures. They make up lies. They make up lies so they can demonize you. Once you demonize someone, once you make someone a monster and you make them impersonal, then you can attack them. So that's the strategy. Same strategy Hitler used with the Jewish people and people he did not like. He demonized the Jewish people and all the ills of, of almost all the ills of Germany were because of, the, because of the Jewish people. And we see this happening in different regimes because once they make you a hate, they say that this person's a problem and they say bad things about you. And once they make you a monster, now you can kill a monster. And so what they're trying to do is to do it to us. Now, if we're using the same tactic and calling them monsters and fighting back the same way, how different are we than the world? Jesus says even, even people that are unbelievers are nice to people they like, but you ought to be different. So what did they say about the early church? They used to say in the early church that we were cannibals. They did. They made up stories that they eat flesh and they drink blood. And so oh, I can't believe they do. They do that there? Yeah, we should stop that. They also said, don't, don't be offended by this, but they also said because Christians in the early days of the church, the first couple hundred years, what they would do is they would take care of people and they would bury the bodies of those that died. So they accused the church of, of necrophilia. I'm not, this is historical. I'm not making this up. They also believed that we were haters of unity. We did not worship Zeus and all these various things. We did not worship the emperor. Therefore, we, we were against that. So they would say all sorts of horrific things about the church so they could persecute him. Have you noticed? That's what's happening today. They're labeling people that we are haters and that we are a health crisis. We're causing psychological problems to people, which in turn causes physical problems. People are dying because of the vitriol that we, the, the so-called churches, are talking about. And that's what they're trying to do. We're going to be called a disease. We're, we are a disease that had to be dealt with. In fact, I was just talking to uh, this past week, I was uh, talking to a missionary that was from Ukraine and told me what was going on in Ukraine. Last time the Russia went to Ukraine, they took a certain port city. Now there's over 100,000 troops on the line, ready to go in, and this is what they told me. So you know what happened in Ukraine? You didn't hear about the American news very much. This is what they would do. The Russian Orthodox Church talked to the Russian government and said, hey, listen, we'll help you. We'll help steer the people's hearts to go back to Mother Russia. But you need to do something for us. You need to wipe out those evangelical churches. You need to get rid of these church. We'll give you the addresses. And so this is a true story. I'm not making this up. So the Soviet army, I'm sorry, Soviet army. It's basically the same thing, by the way, different name. The Russian army launched missiles and destroyed churches. They killed pastors and put them in prison. Why? Because they collaborated with the church. In China, you have to register your church or you can lose your job. In China, they have cameras with face recognition looking at you and marking you down and watching you, and so they can take care of you. This is what's happening, everybody. And right now, I'm concerned for, uh, for Ukraine because the Russian troops are on the border there. They might come in. I don't think the world has the resolve to help. So what's going to happen to those believers and what's going to happen to those in Ukraine? What's going to happen even to our, listen, we may not, we may not believe in Islam, but what about, the, what about the Muslims that are being persecuted in China? We should stand up for anybody that's being persecuted. Okay? So this is what's happening. In fact, I was reading the other day, uh, there is a, a, a professor and an author by the name of David Gushy, and he was being interviewed by the New York Times and he's one that believes that we should embrace LGBTQI and that we should have marriages of same-sex couples should be married in the church. Okay, this is what he says. He says, it's not enough just to politely accept it. But if you don't fully embrace this, you are part of a disease, end quote. This is what they are saying about us. This is the enemy behind them. 
oh, come on, Pastor, you're, you know, you're kind of, you're making, no, I'm not making a big deal of this. Do you know right now in, in Canada, there's just passed a law, went through the Senate without any problems, uh, whatever, I'm sorry, whatever their name or their uh, parliament, thank you, their parliament, what happened was they went, they passed a bill, and in the bill, basically the way it's written, they could close down a church or put a pastor, uh, find a pastor for reading Romans chapter 1 or not doing a wedding. They said, well, we make provisions for that. But based upon what they say in that law, and it passed like that, boom, it's happening in Canada. This is the stuff that's happening, everybody. And um, if we fully don't endorse and have complete acceptance that the Bible completely speaks against, we will be called a hate group causing a health crisis. This is why I'm concerned right now with what's going on. The table's being set. When something's a health crisis, then it gives you a different category. When you're considered a domestic terrorist, they can, they can, they can try you differently than an American citizen. So, oh, Pastor, you're an alarmist, you're a conspiracy. I'm not a conspiracy theory. This is the truth, everybody. So what do we do? We'll talk about it towards the end of the service, if not next week. So you come back. You know, there's a Roman uh, emperor, Diocletian, in 284 to 305, made monuments that said, I have, I have eliminated the virus of Christianity. So, by the way, Diocletius, he's dead, and the church is alive and well. What's going on in Iran right now? What's going on in, in Pakistan? What's going on in Afghanistan? You can't stop the church. In fact, we have people in our church that are from Iran that are refugees that came out of there, and God is doing miraculous things in these countries. You can't stop the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it comes alive like never before. When I was talking to the gentleman, yeah, go ahead. And, and this is happening in the United States of America, by the way. Last year, Oral Roberts University has a basketball team. They're Division I, or I think that's what they call them. And they went to Sweet 16. They were going towards March Madness. And it was all over the papers. Oh, we can't have that. They, can't, they don't believe it's okay. They don't allow couples to sleep together of the same sex. or un, not, They don't let people get together if they're not married, including such and such people. And so as a result, that they're hate mongers, and they're against homosexuality against the LGBT community. Therefore, they must be banned. And I'm telling you, they made a big deal out of it. It was on news programs. And finally, they, through fighting, through legal means, they were okay. Right now, I just read, uh, there's a chicken place. I'm not going to mention the name. It starts with filet. <laughs> it ends with filet, and it begins with chicken. You take off the E-N, you put chick. But anyhow, but I didn't mention the name. They're trying to put, go on a rest stop in New Jersey. Oh, no, they're hate. They hate. The chicken hate. Why? They hire LGBTQ people in that place. They hire all sorts of people in that place. But because the owner gave to an organization, the uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes or something like that, because he gave to an organization that believes in biblical morals that have been around for 4,000 years, they consider them a hate crime. And what they do, they paint it the wrong way. So every time you have a, you know, that's what they're saying. And that's not correct. They twist it and they make it to be a monster. This is how you persecute someone. Come on, you all do when you argue against somebody. For all of you that are married, you turn your spouse into a horrific person. I know what you meant when you said that. <laughs> so once you make your spouse bad, then you can attack them. And this is what happens all the time. We do it all the time. We demonize people. And, and, and that's what begins to happen. So, listen, I, I, I'm going I'm to share this with you as well. I, 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 know, a fr I know somebody that uh, was also um, is a Christian and proclaims Christ and puts all sorts of posts. And they're walking along uh, in a certain public area, and they have paraphernalia of a political party on. And uh, it's very obvious. It's all over the person. And they said, I'm being persecuted for Christ. Praise God. And it wasn't because of Jesus Christ, because of the political party. Hello? That's dumb. That's wrong. We should vote for righteous laws, and we should look at the laws and try to do the best we can. But we have to step out and not be lumped in to a political system where they can say, ah, all those people are blankers. I mean, I mentioned the political parties. Oh, they're left, they're right, and they, and they put them in a little category. We've done it. Both people, we all do it to each other. Come on. Well, those liberals, those right-wing nut jobs. Those anti-science people. Ba -da -da -da. And, and what do you do? You make them ridiculous. And you bring up things that are not even true. There are crazy sides on both sides. And what we do is make a caricature of those people. So these are things that happen. 
So these are things that can happen to us. So what do we do? And First Peter says this, if you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Because the spirit of glory and God rests upon you. But let none of your suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a what? What's a meddler? Is that someone that melds, uh, takes care of metal? What's a meddler? No, someone that gets involved in people's business, a busybody, stirring up strife and problems. That's evil too, by the way. So you can start out, well, did you hear what happened to them? What did, oh, they did this or the other. Really? Yeah. <laughs> they call themselves a Christian. <laughs> you should see what they did. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing you know, it goes all around. That's, that's the same thing. You demonize someone, and then you can attack them, and you feel good about yourself. That's what begins to happen. But we must prepare ourselves for these days are coming. They're going to be coming days. We're going to be persecuted. What are we to do? What are we to do in these coming days? That's what Jesus says. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you. And you know what revival, or, or, not revival, revival means saying bad things about you. Talked to a pastor this past week. It was the end of the year. Uh, these gentlemen work for a corporate uh, for the stock exchange, they make a lot of money, and they're getting bonuses, and they were not given bonuses. And this is what the boss said. Well, since you, we know you're going to give the money to the church, why bother to give you a bonus? It's happening already. Stuff like that is happening. We must prepare ourselves for these things. And so we have to, first of all, Jesus says, don't worry. Follow me, and the Holy Spirit will tell you what to say. I was talking to, his name is Dajava, if I said his name correctly. He's an Indian man that we support for Project Rescue. We were able to give over $30,000 of oxygen equipment to help during the COVID problem in India. I had a lunch with him this past week. What a wonderful man of God. And he's sharing with me, he said, what's going on over there? Oh, it's tough. But praise God, we love when we get persecuted because God always comes through. He said, we're seeing miracles take place. We're praying for people that are persecuted and they're getting healed. He tells us these great stories. Oh, God protects us. He's smart about it, but he's talking about, I, I don't, we don't worry about it because every, I've, been, I've been doing this for 40 years. And we've been persecuted for years, and God always does a miracle. Somehow, some way, something happens, even when bad things happen. He was excited about it. He's not worried about it. So God takes care of us. It, 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 um, he tells me stories that are happening. I'm like, wow. And we get upset because we're afraid to pray at a restaurant? We're afraid to say we're a Christian? And these people are not afraid at all. So what are we to do in this time? How are we supposed to handle? Okay, this is what we're supposed to do. Prepare ourselves. It's coming. It's going to come. All right, everybody? It's coming. It's here already. Can you feel it? Can you see it? It's on its way. It's ramping up. It's ratcheting up. It's happening. What are we to do? We need to prepare ourselves. Don't be surprised. Jesus says you will be persecuted if you follow him. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If you're not being persecuted, you've got to ask yourself a question. Am I living a godly life? Or would I just say, yeah, I'm a Christian. I do whatever I want to do. I come to church on Sunday, just check the box and do whatever I want to do. And I'll lie, I'll steal, I'll, I'll say wrong things about the product. I'll, I'll sleep with this person. I'll, I'll drink this, I'll do this. And I'll, I'll gossip about somebody. And I'll, I'll, I'll come late and leave early. And I'll do all these things because after all, they're not paying me enough money. No, and then, indeed, all who desire to live godly life in Christ will be persecuted. And my friends, you will be persecuted. But don't be persecuted for being this is a Greek word. It's called idiot. <laughs> don't, be a, don't be persecuted because you are acting like a jerk, or I'm acting like a jerk. I've been a jerk a couple times. That's not what we're called to do. I know it's easy to do. When you see our rights eroding, when you see these horrible things, you have righteous indignation comes up in you, right? But what happens is that we correct in the wrong manner. For those of you that have animals, when your dog or cat does something they shouldn't do, you want to bring correction, have you ever gone over to the line and had a meal the following day? No, I'm just kidding. I... <sighs> and shared it with the animal. What's wrong with you people? Goodness gracious. But, you know, it ever happened to you where you overreact to something that happens? Yeah, that's what can begin to happen. We've got to prepare ourselves. We have to realize it's going to happen. So we will be persecuted while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So prepare ourselves. What do we do? 
We need to draw near to God in these times. We need to empower ourselves with the word of God. We need to know the word of God. We need to be prepared, everybody, because the days are coming, and you and I need to stand, because I'm afraid that many in the church are going to walk away. There are people who will abandon ship. They will abandon their faith, and they will not be with Christ in eternity. The Bible says it. Prepare ourselves. Draw near to God. This is what 1 John says. Do not love the world or the things in the world. Wait a minute. Does the Bible not say, for God so what? He loved the world. So what? This is, see, that's why you can't trust the Bible. The Bible says that God loves the world. No, we can't love the world. No, we're not talking about loving the people in the world, but the things of the world. Do not love the, the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Well, what's, what are those things in the world? For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh. These are things that I want to have. I'm hungry, so I eat. I want to do this. I, I want to get involved with someone in a wrong type of way, which should be related to marriage only. I desire this. I'm going to take it. I'm going to do whatever my flesh tells me. I cannot deny my flesh because that will do me harm. I must be what I feel because what I feel is real. What I feel is truth. Everything else is a lie. So my truth, I feel this way. Since I feel this way, I must act this way. Okay? That's called desires of the flesh. The desires of the eyes. I got to have that car. I got to have that job. I got to have that, that person. And I don't care what it takes. I got to have those desires. So the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eye, and the pride of life. By the way, these three categories, every single sin known to man fits into one of those three or a combination of them all. Those are the things that will get you all the time. They get me, they get everybody. And, it's these, and the worst one is pride because that's the one that Satan fell on. It's the flesh. It's the desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. It is not from the Father, but it's from the world. So if we love the system of the world. The world is all about the flesh. I mean, the advertising agencies are all about you need to indulge your flesh, right? You need to give in to us. All the music we listen to, I feel, therefore, I will do. I'm going to take this person and do blankety blank blank. And it talks about that. And, oh, it's a nice rhyme. It's a nice rap. I don't think so, everybody. Or a country western song. Whatever you listen to. And you fill your mind with this. I desire my flesh. Desires of the eyes. I got to have this. I got to have that. I got to have this. I don't care. I'm going to lie. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to steal. You know, this is all what's happening. Oh, I'm pride. I need to be the first. I, I, why is that person speaking and not me? I should be singing the solo. I should be doing this. A pride of life. These are the things that get us down. These are things of the world. That's how the world operates. The only way we're going to break it is break these things in our lives. So what are we to do? Prepare ourselves. Draw near to God. Focus on eternity. The Bible says, draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So, focus on eternity. This is what all the martyrs have done, and they will continue to do. And this is what Jesus did. You're going to hear me say this so many times. Jesus says, for the joy, the book of Hebrews says, for the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross. That's why I say nearly every single week, the best days are always ahead for those in Christ Jesus. I don't care how bad it is. It's going to get better one day in heaven. This is not all there is. There's more to this life than right here, right now. You are an eternal being temporarily in a physical body for an extremely limited period of time. We need to focus on eternity. That's what we need to focus upon. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where you put things in a, in a, in a garage sale two, two weeks after Christmas. No. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. How do you do treasures in heaven? You help someone out without the person knowing it. You are a blessing to someone without looking for something in return. You're, you are going to love somebody despite what they do to you. You're going to worship God. You're going to read your word to know God, not to brag about how much you come to church. Whatever you do for God in love, in relationship, is both here and now and forevermore. You can pass through a church and lead up a Bible study and do it for your ego. People still get blessed because the word of God will not return without void. But you lost your, re lost your reward. We are to think about heaven, lay up treasures in heaven. Is that a good motivation? I think it is. Absolutely. The Bible talks about it. So that's what we need to be able to do. 
And in 2 Corinthians 4.17, the Apostle Paul says this, For this light and momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond comparison. What is to come is so much better than what you and I are experiencing. We need to focus on eternity. As we look, not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. I like what Jim Elliott, the missionary Ecuador, said this. He's no fool who gives away what he can't keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives away what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He died for his faith in Ecuador. Great story. There's a book called um, Tip of the Spear. Talks about how that whole cannibal uh, tribe came to know God, and even the person that killed Elizabeth, Elizabeth Elliot's husband. My friends, you're no fool to give away what you cannot keep, to gain what you cannot lose. This is what God is calling us to. So we are to prepare ourselves. It's going to happen. Just draw near to God. This is why it's important to gather together and encourage each other as we see the day coming. We need to focus on eternity, remind each other of that. We need to pray for our persecutors. Not curse them, but pray for them. We need to pray for the other party we don't like. We need to pray for our president. We don't need to entertain jokes. I know it's funny to laugh. I know the memes are funny, but it's not really, that's not right. The Bible says earn respect. Respect your leaders. Okay? Pray for our persecutors. Pray for people that you don't like. Here's another one. Talk to people who you don't like. This is what I found. When you, when you hear all those people over there, well, why don't you talk to those people? When you go to a coffee shop, you're going to encounter all kinds of people. And so I, I've, I've sat and I've had conversations with people that changed their identity. And you sit when you talk with them and you just listen and you ask questions and you show them respect and you show them love. I'm not saying what they're doing is correct, but obviously they need to know Jesus. And Jesus died for those folks. They don't know better. They're not, you know, so you just listen to them. You talk to them. Gain, gain credibility by your love. Now, they still might persecute you, but why not listen? Why not break out of our little boxes that we've made and quarantine ourselves to people that look like us, sound like us, and all that? And why don't you go with different people that are different than you and listen to them and show the love of Christ? I'm not saying we have to accept what they do, but pray for our persecutors. Encourage each other and pray and love and respect all people. I want to tell you it's so important. But I will tell you that there are people that are going to fall away. There are people that are going to fall away. And what else are we to do? We talked about all these things that we can do. Prepare ourselves, draw near to God, focus on eternity, pray for our persecutors, encourage each other and pray, love and reach people. And also this, I mentioned it last week, I'll mention it again. Use the talent of being an American citizen to its fullest wisely. Listen, everybody, the Apostle Paul, as I mentioned last week, was a Roman citizen. He said, you cannot beat me like this. I'm a Roman citizen. If I was just Jewish, you could do this to me. But not only am I Jewish, I'm a Roman citizen. I appeal to Caesar. So two times in Scripture, in the book of Acts, one time he's gotten beat. He said, you cannot beat me like this. And they were scared. Uh-oh, we're going to get in trouble. So we have rights as American citizens. We have rights to represent a former government. We have rights to contact our senators and our legislators. We have a right to vote. We have a right to go to school board, school board meetings and say the curriculum that you're teaching us, our children, we find offensive and it's not something that is appropriate. But we do it with what? Respect. I know you get frustrated. I get it. But do it respectfully. You can't win someone that you hate. You got to show love, but stand up strong and be wise. Listen, I've been accused of all kinds of crazy stuff, by the way. I'm not going to share with you what they are. There's a number of years ago, number of, over 10 years ago, I was accused of stuff that was absolutely insane. And I made the mistake of entertaining those accusations. And all it did is stir it up more and stir it up problems. So this is what I learned. If it's not true, I'm not going to waste my time arguing with somebody about it. Just keep on going. Don't entertain that. It's like, it's, it's almost like um, Hezekiah. Is it true that you're trying to take, no, it says, I don't have time for that. I am a busy person. 
So that's the thing I will say. I'm sorry, I don't have time for that. I got more important things to do. I'm not going to entertain these accusations. Don't entertain accusations. All it does is stir it up and broadcast it more. When you're doing the right thing, you just keep going the right direction. Ignore the naysayers. Ignore people that say stuff and speak the truth in love, with grace, with power. The people that Jesus was really upset with primarily were the church people. Just saying. So use the talents of... So listen, everybody. They didn't have this in the day of, of Jesus. They didn't have this in the day of Paul. We have a great government here. It's a wonderful government. We've got to utilize what we have. We need to support lawyers that will defend, defend our causes. But we must do it differently than the world does it. We must do it respectfully. We must be, as Jesus says, wise as serpents and gentle as doves. Wise. Jesus did not answer his accusers. They'd ask him all kinds of questions. We'd probably get him in trouble. He wouldn't answer them. Let's be wise. I just say it like it is. Yeah, and you make yourself look foolish. That They're trying to trap you. Do not enter the trap. Do not walk into it. Don't waste your breath. Look for the opportune time to speak and then speak. And this takes wisdom. And Jesus says, when you are taken before people, the Holy Spirit will give you words to say. And this is what we're called to do during these times. In John 15, 18, and 20, it says this. If the world hates you, Know that it has hated me. This is Jesus speaking, by the way, okay, as we conclude as the worship team makes their way back. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would what? Love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, we are in the world but not of the world. We are in the world, but not of the world. I've used this illustration before, but I think it really demonstrates so clearly what we're called to be. If you think about mammals, let's just use whales. Whales live in the ocean, but they're not of the ocean. They live in a different climate and an environment. Fish breathe the water and extract oxygen from the water, most fish are, are basically, they're cold-blooded, which simply means whatever the temperature of the body of water is, they will become. Mammals, however, like whales, have their own internal heat. They're like us. We're mammals. I'm not a whale, though. Though the way I've been eating over the holidays. Nevertheless. So what happens is, what, what do they have? They're warm-blooded animals. But they live in the ocean. My friends, we're in the world, but not of the ocean. We're not of the world. Whales are in the ocean, but not of the ocean. What do whales have to do? And dolphins. They go up. What do they break through the atmosphere of the ocean into a different atmosphere? And they breathe in the air of heaven. And then they go back down. And they have the power and the ability to live in a different world than they're designed to be as far as their their, in, their internals are. So, my friends, are you breaking through and breathing into heaven? Are you going to the other world and breathing in the Spirit of God? Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit, and he breathed on them. Are you breathing in the Holy Spirit so you and I can be in the world but not of it? Or are we transforming from a mammal to a cold-blooded Christian? Where whatever the atmosphere is, I don't want to offend anybody. I'll just become like the rest. My friends, you are in the world, but not of it. Let's be who God called us to be. Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the world that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep your word. Listen, God, does not, God wants us to be healers of relationships. I also believe God wants us to function more in signs and wonders. Not so we can show off. Well, look what I did. No. We should be praying for people. Pray for people. Don't be, don't be like, let me pray for you because I'm a Christian. Don't do it that way. Hey, would you mind um, if I just prayed for you? I, I, you know, God helps me out, and I, I just I see you're going through something, and I just want to ask that God would bless you. He's helped me. Do it humbly. Don't do it like, let me pray for you, my little young man. No, do it respectfully. Pray for people. Hey, help, let me pray for you. If they don't want you to pray for them, just pray for them anyhow. Anyone will take prayer. Be a blessing, right? Bless those who persecute you. 
And so they will listen to us. God has given us the word. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I ask for your anointing. Holy Spirit, I pray you'd anoint this place right now. Everyone that's here and everyone that's watching online, Lord, may we walk in the power of your spirit, Father, in these days. May we bring life where there's death. May we speak life to people. Holy Spirit, give us insight to people's lives that when we meet them, we would speak prophetic words, words about their destiny in a way that's not spooky or weird, but we would just say nice things. We would see what you see in those people that can come to you. Lord, let we speak life to them. In Jesus' name. We pray for healings even to take place. I commission you in the name of Jesus to pray for people, to see them even healed physically, mentally, and spiritually. Father, I thank you for that in Jesus' name. We declare that Cornerstone Church will be a church of healing. Not just when we're gathering the walls of this place, but when we go to our homes, we go to our office places, we go to the high schools, the junior high schools, or our colleges, Father, that we would be a blessing and that we be your representation. In love and grace, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. It's time for us to stand up and be men and women of God, are you willing to do that today? Are you willing to be a man and a woman of God? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. How many of you would say this morning that I recognize that I've been cowering too much? I've been like a fish, or I've allowed the culture to intimidate me. But today I want to make a change. I want to be bold for God, with God. I want to stand up for truth in love. How many would say that today? Just raise your hand. Say, I, I'm tired of living this. I want to live for God. I want to live for God and not be ashamed. Can we just raise your hand? There's only three or four of you. I can't believe it. How many of you are willing to serve God with everything you have? Can I just see a show of hands? So, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that we would be bold for you and that we'd be loving. And, Father, we thank you that greater is you that's within us than the heat that's in the world. We thank you, Father, that we're more than conquerors through you. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we leave, we do this every single week. How are you with Jesus Christ? Have you given your life to Christ? I'm not talking about believing in Christ, but have you given your life to Christ? If it's still your life, you're not a Christian. You're just a Christian philosopher. You're like Christian philosophy. You're only a truly a believer and born again when you give your life completely to God. Maybe you've never done it. Maybe you used to follow God and you never did. I'm going to ask you once again to bow your heads. I'm going to pray a prayer. If you'll take pray this prayer together. How many would say right now, I want to give my life to Jesus. I've never done it, but today is the day. Or I used to walk with God and I've walked away, but today I want to get right. Can I see a quick show of hands? You want to give your life to Christ for the very first time or renewed your commitment. Thank you. Anybody else today? Okay, let's pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, Pray in your mind, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you rose again from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of everything I've ever done wrong, both known and unknown. I choose to turn away from what I know is wrong. And today I declare you are God and I am not. Thank you that I am now your child. Thank you that my sins are forgiven in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe you became born again. And in your front pocket of your seat, there are cards you can pull out. It says, my commitment today. Also online, you can do the same. Fill it out. What you can do is you can get your phone out, and you can text to 860-499-4888. That's 860-499-4888. And write down, believe. We'll help you with the next steps. After, right after the service, we'll have folks up here to pray with you for anything you need, include telling them what happened. In the front desk, you can tell somebody and hand your card in. We'll give you a Bible, and we have a, we're going to have a uh, helping you on your journey. In a few weeks, we're going to have a course to help you with that in your new journey in Christ. Okay, everybody? Before we leave, we also want to give you an opportunity to give. And I'm telling you right now, in these crazy economic times, 
God will take care of our needs. Trust him and see if not, he will open. I'm telling you guys, it works. Spend less than you make. Tithe 10% and be generous, realizing it's all God's. And watch what God will do. So, Father, I pray you bless this offering today. In Jesus' name, meet everyone's needs supernaturally. Lord, thank you. Your word is true. It always comes through. In Jesus' name, amen. Four different ways. You can text 833-245-5608. There are boxes in the back. You can put your envelopes. You can go to cornerstonecheshire.com. You can push pay app. Okay, everybody? Hey, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow at our prayer time at 6.30 a.m., either in line or in person. God bless you. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he fill you with his power and his strength. May the Holy Spirit empower you to be the men and the women he's called you to be. Amen and amen.